wanted to run through the agenda for today really quickly. Um, what we're going to do is um, Emily's going to share a little bit about the um, the guidelines, the safety and health guidelines on reopening now that it's um, legal for some of our businesses to do so. And then um, uh, Bethany's going to review some of the uh, suggestions and business model modifications that may be necessary to um, comply with the health and safety guidelines and um, and settle in for what may be a long haul under, under this um, restrictive um, system for our businesses to keep functioning. And then um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the updates on the um, Paycheck Protection Program and the Economic Injury Disaster Loan and um, the uh, Employee Retention Credit, some of those programs, and, and try and help you sift through what's the right strategy for you. And then we're going to end with some updates from James on unemployment, and then we'll take any questions and answers that you've got. Um, just some housekeeping stuff. As we go through the webinar, if any uh, questions or comments pop into your mind, just use the chat box in Zoom, and that way we'll be able to get through the whole agenda, and as soon as we get to the end, I'll start back going through your questions one by one. So just pop those into the chat box as they come into your mind. I also want to remind you that Emily's still sending out the daily emails with the updates, and it's definitely the quickest way to get information from us. Um, and, um, and the resource guide we're still updating every day. And we're still doing our classes. So uh, one of the things that's happened with the classes is, yeah, I, I mean, we're starting with the PPP classes and cash flow classes. They're really small groups. They're you know, two to seven people. So we're really digging in um, on those specific topics. So if you've got technical questions, hopping on the next one of those classes may be the best way to get your questions answered quickly and maybe pick up some few, a few tips and pointers from some of your fellow business owners. So you can register for those classes, same place you find our resource guide. So I am gonna turn it over to Emily to talk a little bit about the um, guidelines that the governor's issued for the businesses that can reopen. Emily? All right, thanks, Josh. Let me get my screen pulled up. Um, Y'all are about to see my incredibly messy desktop, so I apologize for that. Got a lot of resources to look at right now. Um, so y'all holler if y'all can see that because I can't see the chat right now. Everybody good? Great. All right, so reopening guidelines. So all of y'all I'm sure are very familiar with this executive order at this point, or have probably reviewed it, but last week, um, Governor Kemp signed the Re Reviving a Healthy Georgia Executive Order. Um, and this order outlines what um, businesses can now reopen and what they are expected to do should they decide to reopen. Um, it still leaves most businesses with the choice to reopen so they can make that decision whether or not they are ready to implement the measures that can keep their customers and employees safe but it's still an individual choice for most of those business owners that gives you the option to reopen. Um, you can find this file. What I did is I just Googled reviving a healthy Georgia executive order. Um, and it was the first website to pop up, um, the georgia.gov website with their list of executive orders. It's the file um, with the date of um, 04.23.20.02. Um, and that includes everything that you need to know about what businesses can reopen and um, what they are expected to do when they reopen. Um, we've also, we've shared that in our emails. It's linked in our resource guide if you need to reference that order. So look out for that um, as you're looking through the resource guide. We've also shared this infographic a few times in our email that we think is a really great resource that outlines the 20 minimum basic operations that if you're reopening, you have to follow. Now, if you are cert of a certain industry, um, there are some additional measures you have to take, but this is mostly what we're going to review today because it applies to everyone. 
Um, so first and foremost, who can reopen? As of April 24th, gyms and fitness centers, body art studios, um, tattoo parlors, nail salons, hair salons, barber shops, um, massage therapists, tanning facilities, and bowling alleys could reopen if they chose to do so. Again, there are very specific measures per those industries that they must follow if they make the decision to reopen. Um, I don't think we have anyone who falls in those categories on the call today, but um, if you have any questions or need help getting to those additional measures um, that those specific industries have to follow, let me know. I'd be happy to help you find that information um, in that order. And then as of April 27th, indoor movie theaters, private social clubs, and dine-in services could reopen. Um, Again, this is fully a choice. This is a choice you have to make that is best for your business, your customers, and employees. If you, if you decide to open your dining room, there are 39 additional measures that you must follow that are outlined in that executive order. And we have some resources for you to help navigate those additional measures as well. Um, and as of right now, bars and performance venues are to remain closed until May 13th. So just to dive right into those minimum basic operations. First, you wanna be sure that everyone coming to your place of business is healthy. Your employees don't show any symptoms and they are not expected or required to come to work if they are sick. Um, one really great resource locally, the Army National Guard is offering um, COVID testing on site at your business for your employees. So if that's something you wanna take advantage of, you can email um, First Lieutenant Bobby Kwan. We've included this in our emails and we'll include it again today. Um, you can set up a time to do that on set on-site testing for your employees. If this is something that you decide to do, especially if you're a restaurant who's getting ready to reopen your dining room and you have a large staff, um, I would post this on social media as much as you can. Anything you're doing to um, protect your employees and customers, you need to update everyone on that across your social media platforms. And if you're going above and beyond, like doing something like this, like setting up on-site testing, be sure that you're communicating to your constituents that that is an additional measure you're taking to ensure the safety of your customers and employees. Um, next, you just want to be sure that you're enhancing the sanitation of your workplace, um, requiring hand washing, that you have a good hand washing station for your employees, and providing PPE um, to workers when you can. So, um, one resource I want to outline locally too is Daphne's 525. They have been making masks like crazy from cloth. So um, they can even brand those for your business if you wanted to have um, your logo embroidered on them um, to make your staff look more uniform or you all want a, um, your corporate colors or whatever the case is. Um, you can utilize that local resource. And again, if you go and buy some masks from Daphne's or whoever, um, that's something I would highlight on social media again. Show, post a picture of your employees wearing your mask so that customers know um, this additional measure is taking place when they come into your place of business. Um, and especially if you're buying it from Daphne's, another example of local supporting local, which y'all are also great about doing anyway. Um, next, um, these really apply, I think, more to um, traditional offices like Newtown, like we've been doing teleworking. We have staggered shifts for people who still need to come into our office, write checks or do things like that, check on things. Um, we hold our meetings virtually. Um, we do all of our staff meetings through Zooms, that sort of thing. Um, but for y'all, I think mainly you want to be sure that your um, employees are not all gathering in one place at a time, that they're remaining six feet apart, um, and that the areas where they take breaks, they can also maintain that social distancing. So you may want to close the break room or only allow one person at a time to be in the break room or two, depending on the size of it, or wherever people tend to take their breaks, just be sure that you're thinking about um, how you can maintain social distancing in those areas. Um, next, um, you wanna be sure that there's not a lot of contact going on on the same services. So um, avoid shared use of work tools and equipment. So if you're taking orders over the phone, um, that's one, area you want to think about a lot, maybe only one person 
per shift is the person answering that phone. Be sure that you have sanitation wipes beside it, that sort of thing. Um, the same goes with any kind of POS system. Um, prohibit handshaking and encourage hand hygiene um, by placing notices um, at your hand washing stations and high traffic areas. Um, you can download a, a sign if you need it from DPH. Um, again, I just Googled hand washing sign Georgia and this came up um, specific to COVID-19. So um, we'll provide y'all a link with that uh, template as well if you need it. Um, and then this, these next orders really go back to some of the things we talked about last week in our weekly webinar when it came to best practices for curbside pickup. You want to be sure that payment is contactless as possible. So um, try to you know make it so that you can turn your POS system um, so that only your the customer is touching their card so that they can actually swipe it versus your employees having to do it. Um, don't use pin pads if you can avoid it. Um, try and take orders over the phone, that sort of thing. Um, you wanna, again, be sure that your customers and employees can social distance within your workplace um, and continue to provide those alternate point of sales. So curbside pickup and delivery. Um, here we've got Saranya. Um, making a curbside delivery order. You can see she's got her mask on. Um, this is a really great post showing how they are um, addressing their, um, what their COVID-19 response is um, and how they're addressing it. Um, and then finally, again, just increasing that sp space as much as possible, being sure that you have that six feet distance and providing um, workers with the disinfectant and sanitation products that they need. So um, I know a lot of, or not a lot, but some businesses have shifted where they've been able to make hand sanitizer with products they already have at Pretoria, Pretoria Fields in Albany. And this is an example of a business that's shifted and been able to provide a lot of hand sanitizer to restaurants that they work with. Um, here in Macon, Andrewette through Georgia Artisan, he's been able to make some hand sanitizer. Um, he posted this in our Georgia Main Street um, or in our downtown business center group, sorry, thinking about a different group I'm in, but in our downtown business center group um, posted about some hand hand sanitizer that he's been making um, and how you can reach out to him about that. Um, at Spartan Macon, they've um, started making Shinitizer, um, so they have um, hand sanitizer as well. Um, so those are some local options to get the sanitation um, resources you need. Um, also, if this is something, especially as a retailer, you're having issues getting a hold of, let Newtown know. Um, I'm not going to make any promises, but if enough of you reach out with the same problem, we can probably figure out a way um, to go through some different channels to get some supplies. Um, but again, that's not something I can guarantee, but this is something I would, if you're having trouble getting the sanitation supplies you need, use that downtown business center Facebook group, let people know because there's likely a neighbor who has some stuff they can spare or sell to you, um, or they have a distributor that they work with and can get that um, those materials more quickly. So just be sure to use your network as you're trying to get access access to some of these materials. Um, and again, let people know if you're using these things. Um, and then restaurants, of course, you have some extra guidelines that you need to follow as you're reopening your dining rooms. Um, this is a hot, these are not all of the additional measures that you're expected to follow. Um, like I said, there are 39 outlined in that executive order. But this list was kind of like was a list of highlights that was pulled from the Georgia Restaurants Association of things that um, they feel like, you know, you're not normally going to do anyway. Um, so the big things are no more than 10 patrons per 500 square feet are allowed in your restaurant one time. So you need to figure out your square feet and how many people you can allow in your restaurant to be in compliance. Um, party size, no more than six people. Um, you need to be sure that those tables are spaced adequately apart. Um, employees are required to wear masks. Um, you want to get rid of any kind of self-service stations like salad bars, buffets, drink stations, um, and you have to use pre-rolled silverware um, and 
all those things just to minimize contact and sanitize, keep things sanitized and clean as possible and provide social distancing. Um, so there's some great resources for you specifically as restaurants for reopening. Um, the Georgia Restaurant Association with the National Restaurant Association um, created a really incredible reopening guide. Um, and we'll provide that link in the email today that reviews all of those guidelines and gives you a lot of advice about what you need to do. One thing I love about this guide is that they highlight the things you as restaurants should already be doing um, in order to provide a safe environment for your customers. So they kind of differentiate between what the expectation already is in normal um, circumstances and then highlights what you need to do that's different. So that's a really incredible resource. Um, so as you're making all of these changes and being sure that you're um, keeping your employees and customers safe, you want to be sure you're communicating that with your audience as much as possible. Over communication, I think at this point is key. Um, so we talked a lot about communication tips last week and you can view that webinar on our YouTube channel if you wanna go back and look at that. But this is definitely a situ this is definitely an instance where you wanna acknowledge the situation. Um, the state of Georgia has made national headlines. Um, global headlines really. So everyone knows what our specific situation is in Georgia that Governor Kemp is allowing some businesses to reopen. Um, so to just not acknowledge that situation is not a good idea. You, your customers know that you now have options that you did not have and they wanna know, are you gonna use those options? Are you gonna continue what you're doing? How are you changing your business model? So you wanna be very clear about what you're doing um, now that this order has been put in place and how that changes what you're doing or doesn't change what you're doing. Um, I think Scott did a great job of this um, with Travis Sheen Emporium. Um, you know, he stayed positive and he didn't get political. I think right now, unfortunately, a lot of these things have become very politicized. So you as a business owner don't wanna get embroiled in this politics, regardless of how you feel about it. Um, you don't wanna share that. You want to share what decision you have made as a best practice um, based on the information that you have seen and what has guided you in making that decision. And I think Scott did a great job by doing that when he said, you know, this is a CEO, this is another leader in the community who inspired me, and this is what he said. Um, and that's, you know, how I'm kind of guiding my decision and be sure that you're outlining that you're following um, those guidelines from the state and the CDC um, and that you're staying informed. And, you know, as always, remain positive, um, which Scott is always so great at doing. Um, wanted to highlight two examples from restaurants. Um, Macon Beer Company, I think they did a really great job of explaining you know why they have decided to not reopen their dining rooms at this time um, that they're con still continuing to offer that curbside pickup um, and that you can still place orders and this is how you can do it um, and again thanking and thanking your customers for their continued support i think it's always a good thing to thank um, the people who are supporting you and helping you get through this um, and they include a really great image which if you can include an image if you have a good image to use I would recommend using that. It's going to make your social media posts show up more and get more traction. But if you don't have a great image, don't stress over that either. Um, it's more important to get the message out there. Um, and then the Rookery, they've decided to not reopen and they did an another great job of explaining exactly what they used to make their decisions, um, how they're going about it, and how they'll let people know um, when they are reopened. And I think I really like that um, this was signed by Wes. I think if you can do that, um, put your name as a business owner or, you know, the making um, beer company staff or Travis Jean Emporium team that really human humanizes um, this decision that you're making. Um, it makes it seem like it's not just some brand or corporate entity that's decided to do this. It 
reminds everybody that this is a person in our community who is reading the exact same headlines and having to make a really difficult decision about what is best for their livelihood and the livelihood of their employees. So just think about that as you're writing those posts. It's okay to sign your name to them and that it is encouraged for those big announcements um, as your business model is changing. Um, and then finally, you just want to be sure that you're consistent. Um, use the same language across all platforms. I know that you have to adapt how that's formatted for different ones, but you want to be sure that your message is consistent. If you're using an image, use the same image across all platforms. Be Monroe Salon did this. Um, as you can see, this is three different platforms, but it really looks exactly the same across all three. Um, so for Facebook, Instagram, and they send an email. Um, so just be sure you maintain that consistency. And one thing, you know, we stress social media a lot um, in these discussions because it's so easy to um, get those quick updates out. It's a tool you're already using to market your business and market your products and services, um, but never underestimate your email list. Be sure that if you have been capturing emails and you have an email list, that you are emailing these big decisions out as well, because not everyone is on Facebook or Instagram. A lot of people are, but not everyone, not all of your customers. So you wanna be sure that those folks um, know if there's been a change in your reopening date, if you have changed your business model. You know, you don't have to email as frequently as you're posting on social media, but for those really big, um, decisions related to how you're changing your business, um, be sure that you send those emails and use that same language that you would use on social media. And then um, when you do decide to reopen, be sure that you're communicating that effectively, that you're communicating what you have done to implement these measures that are mandated by the state to ensure the safety of your customers and employees. And it's always a good thing to make that visual. Um, this was a post from 7th Street Salvage of Catherine and Brent, like when we first had to really change how we were doing everything back in March. But I think it's a really, you know, a cute, fun post of them and their masks and how they're addressing the situation. Um, you want to use images that, you know, show what your employees are doing. Are they wearing masks? Or are they wearing gloves? Um, how has your business layout changed? Do you have signs up? Do you have, um, have you shifted the traffic flow of your business? Are there lines on the floor? You know, are there certain ways that people are expected to move through your business now? Um, be sure that you're communicating all of those changes and using images to show those changes so that your customer knows exactly what to expect when they come to their come to your business because it's no longer business as usual. It's not like coming, if someone comes to a restaurant to dine in or goes to a retail shop, it's not gonna be the same ex experience now as it was in February. So you wanna be sure that you show exactly how that experience has changed. Um, and I think a really great resource um, is one from Kroger. They um, have created a blueprint for business and it outlines how they've really shifted their business model, which Bethany's gonna talk about a lot. Um, but it gives you a lot of really good resources or really good things to think about as you're changing your business model and how you need to communicate that to your customers. So that is all that I have. That was great, Emily, thank you. I think that's a great transition point too recognizing that the way we do business now is not going to be the way we did it in February and it's not going to be that way for a very, very long time. I'm going to pitch it over to Bethany and Bethany, if you could just give us um, a quick rundown of how um, business may change and some tools and tricks that we can use to try and adapt. Yeah. Um, so just a couple things, y'all. First of all, I've had a little bit of a connectivity issue. So Josh, stay with me verbally if you're having issues. And also, I'm going to use good old-fashioned PowerPoint. So let me know if it's not playing well here. Um, and, and I do want to say, so I'm one of your customers who doesn't do social media. I'm an email kind of girl. So um, I know that there are a lot. And we, we also pull these together, you know, within a matter of a day or two. So I know there are a lot of great examples of you guys putting a lot of these things to play that I don't have here. But what I've done is synthesize some of the different resources that we've been sharing with you. 
And some of this stuff is pretty common sense, um, but it's good to have it all condensed and in one place. And some of it I do think is insightful. And, and as we all experiment with these things, you know, the whole reason of these webinars and staying connected, even as we're distant, part of it is so that we can learn together as we go and, and be more effective as a front, as a, a downtown uh, business district. So I'm gonna share my screen here. And let me do my my view. Let's see if I can get the. There we go. Okay, so you know one of the things about this time is, on the one hand, it is certainly trying and challenging, um, and it's just I'm sure we're all going to get tired of the word pivot um, over the next few weeks. But it really does also present some opportunities. I mean, if you had a workplace culture that you really, you noticed some things really slipping, um, or maybe just not the kind of team that you really wish you had and putting your best foot forward. I mean, now if there's a time to hit reset with your business model and your team and all that, this is the time to do that and take advantage of it. And you know, one of the things that's definitely gonna be so critical is, and that communication piece is huge to this, is building trust. Your, your customers are really gonna lean on you, not just because they wanna know they're safe. Some of them are choosing to give you their credit card numbers over the phone, which isn't really best practices. They're gonna let you curate and handpick things and just hand them to you in a bag. So you've got to build a level of trust. Inventory management and visual mer merchandising is gonna be so critical. We're not gonna to get to be as tactile over the next couple years, which is kind of sad to me, but visual, visual, visual is gonna be everything. And you're gonna to have to really, really keep track of your inventory. Um, level and quality of service is gonna be so crucial moving forward in a whole new way. I think for our small businesses, this is great. Um, I think customers are really going to need to lean in on you, and it goes back to that trust piece. You're definitely going to have to adapt your model to new consumer behavior, and even when we, um, you know, get our uh, vaccine for COVID-19, things are just going to be different. Um, rebuilding, again, an opportunity to rebuild your workplace place culture, and you're definitely going to have to be very keen on your financials and adjust so that you can be sustainable for the immediate as well as the, the long term. So there are five key areas that I'm gonna go over with you that I've seen sort of broken out in some of the different resources that are out there, health and safety, inventory and menu, merchandising kind of related to that, um, just enhancing e-commerce and off-premise, your staffing and then financials. So, um, if you haven't created new standards uh, and protocol for cleaning your business um, and also just safety measures for your team, go ahead and do that now. Even if you're not open, go ahead. I'm sure there are lots of everything from gyms and things they're going to do to, um, you know, maybe stagger classes and keep sizes to say 10 people a class. They're maybe even going to mark the floor where you can stand. What are your protocols going to be? And you need to get them you know, typed up and in a place because you're going to need to share them with your team and with your customers. Go ahead, as Emily mentioned, and start procuring your necessary cleaning and safety supplies. Um, it, and she's touched on you know, how it needs to range from your customer uh, through to your team. And again, I don't, we're not going to be selling cleaning supplies, but we do have some of our own merchants making some of these things. So let's network so that you guys can have what you need to be open and functioning safely. Um, and also, you know, support some of these businesses who have pivoted to um, provide some of these supplies to you. And then, you know, I also think anything you can do to help remind your customers about social distancing, it's just not habitual. It's not in our brains yet. And so I, I know I need those visual and audio cues all the time right now when I'm out picking up food or when, when I grow the grocery, what have you. And then you need to really go ahead and start thinking about systems for minimizing person to person contact. So a lot of this is, gets touched on and Emily did. I do think for restaurants, reservation only kinds of systems, you know, it's definitely um, also maybe um, there are those texting apps that notify you when your table is ready so people don't have to wait in the same waiting room together. But what's going to be your system for minimizing person to person contact? Um, and I just can't 
reiterate enough to follow up on Emily, how, how important communication is gonna be with this, not only in the precautions you're taking so that people feel safe, but also so that they can be clear and that it's still enjoyable to come and support you. And this literally should be part of your marketing plan moving forward. We didn't you know, ne necessarily share with people how often we mop the floors at our businesses, but now we're going to. Okay, this is a really huge thing here. So um, I think this is a really wise piece of advice to start back with a small menu. If you're a restaurant, that's gonna be food, but if you're a service-based business, it's gonna be a smaller menu of services or really focus on your top retail items. I mean, supply chains are disrupted. They're gonna be disrupted for a long time. And you also need to be a little more agile right now and not make as many large purchases, especially when you first get started. Right, so think about maybe the top 10 uh, best sellers for you on retail side or menu wise, and then consider diversity um, so that you do have a range of choices. Uh, uh, items that you could easily substitute out is something to really keep in mind as well. Um, and then a really important point here uh, is to be more deliberate in varying your price points because a lot of us are either going to truly be cash strapped in the months ahead. And even those of us who aren't are probably gonna be a little more conservative. Now there will be some folks who are gonna be ready to, ready to go, but I think you're gonna find the majority of your customers are gonna be more conservative and you're gonna be need to be a little more mindful about your price point variation than maybe you had to be in the past. And literally thinking about the menu, like you're definitely gonna to need to develop digital uh, and disposable menus if you're a bar or a restaurant, none of those things that we can hold and that you hand back. And for retail, think about, is there a way you can create some kind of digital uh, or virtual shopping list? Not only does this mean less things that they have to hold when they're there, but it also can minimize the kinds of time, the amount of time your customers are spending in your places of business, which for a while is gonna be ideal. So, you know, there's going to be all kinds of ways you really need to sit down and think about how can you really minimize your staff, your team's touches with food, drink, and inventory. So not presetting your bars or table. Maybe just one person is going to run food from now on. Um, uh, if you do a grab and go section, and I've seen this in the in the grocery lot too, don't put out lots and lots of inventory, especially those folks that like to feel around and pick the best one. Just have like a couple so they can just grab, literally grab and go in this case. Um, Folks, you know, like if you are a yoga studio or a gym, can, can folks maybe buy equipment from you that you previously provided for free to diversify your income streams, but then also be sure that they're, they're bringing them and so that they're clean. What, what can you do to minimize touches with food, drink, and inventory? Um, this is just, again, reiterate a lot of what Emily just said. I don't think we can underline this enough, and we talked about this some last week, but the demand is going to remain for pickup. So tighten up your curbside pickup system. If you're using food and you don't have like the heating lamps to keep your food warm, really consider the investment in that. Uh, go ahead and start purchasing any kind of to-go uh, items or branded bags, test them, make sure they're working well for you. Um, I, Josh and James are great at this. I volunteer them to help you run numbers to consider alternate ways to get business. I think a lot of restaurants as a, for instance, really um, poo poo, you know, like the equivalents of the door dashes, these delivery services. And I realize they take a big cut, but if they cre uh, increase your overall sales by 25%, then maybe right now that's not such a bad thing. So what are some other ways? And if you're not doing e-commerce yet or you're not doing Etsy, um, you know, what have you, I would really encourage you to run the numbers and see if right now that's a viable option for you. Um, one of the things that we've been reading, and I think this is definitely going to be true, we've had a good bit of focus, you know, on family meals and family um, activities. But we do think, you know, people are definitely getting hungry to reconnect and for practical reasons, we're going to need to start getting together in small group groups for work or for graduation. So what kinds of things can you do maybe, you know, um, further develop a catering arm of your business for these kinds of small group gatherings and special events, maybe you can start uh, curating like the kinds of decorations that they need that they could buy in just one bag. But how can you start serving what we think is gonna be sort of an increased kind of need
customer wise through e-commerce and as an off-premise kind of um, market demand. And something to really think about is are you going to need new positions or are you going to need to train yourself or your team to effectively support your, um, you know, increased curbside service in your e-commerce channels? Uh, I just don't think there's any doubt that we're going to need to further capitalize on a lot of these digital tools that are out there, but that really may mean shifting the uh, makeup of your team and your team's expertise. Um, and I do just want to take a time out. This could go at a couple places in this presentation. Um, but you really, I mean, you should probably, if you had a business plan and you can take a few deep breaths and, and, and breathe through and sit with it, you really should probably revisit the whole business plan, but at least sit down and think about who has been supporting you lately. And is it the same primary customer as it was before? And are you noticing any shifts? Because what you really may find is you're, you do still have that primary customer now, but that primary customer may not stay with you. Um, in the months ahead. I think we're definitely going to see some generational differences in spending and consumer behavior over the next year. At some point, the boomers probably are just going to get too tired of being conservative and they're going to come back out and have a good time. But at that point, the millennials may be totally out of cash and they're just going to be staying home Netflix and then chilling, as they say, right? So you need to really be paying close attention more than ever to your customer's behavior. And we talked about this last week and you guys have been doing a great job of this, but what is their pain right now because of this COVID-19 pandemic and how can you solve it? The family cooking kits are great. I saw um, in a separate uh, community, a business that was doing cocktail kits to go. We're all trying to tap into our inner creatives, the online classes, but you really need to do that check back in with your customer. Who's your customer base? And then I think one of the areas that, um, you know, really does present some opportunity is rebuilding your team. Um, it, you know, in, in the articles that I've read, obviously folks who get PPP loans, you're going to have to bring back your team, uh, very quickly. If, if not, you know, most of the articles really suggest slowly rebuilding your team and you're kind of going to have a little bit of what we would call buy a buyer's market, right? In real estate, because there's probably going to be more people looking for jobs than before. Um, you may have the option to hire folks with a little more experience than you had on your team previously. But most importantly, go ahead and take the time now to revisit your core values. Um, this is actually a pretty fun activity. We do this one in our Entrepreneurs Academy. I know this was one Scott loved a lot with us. Revisit your mission and hire this time based on those values, based on that mission. We've got some great worksheets on this if you have any interest in thinking that through. Definitely update your training program and it should critically include you know, your new cleaning, uh, and health, health protocols. And so I don't care if you're bringing back everybody that's the same as before, you're going to need to do a revisit and, and hold that, you know, hold that new training program with your team. Um, develop maybe more effective internal channels of communication. This is going to be important, important because again, consistency, the safety piece, building the level of trust, the need for greater levels of service, but it's also going to keep your team safer if you can minimize having to come over and tell them that, oh no, this is the new way we're doing it. Um, uh, we were using te weekly text at Sparks Yoga for a while. That I actually found that to be better than anything, but private Facebook groups here are really great or maybe just a posting every day when your team comes in, but um, really think about new ways and effective ways to internally communicate with your team. Um, and this is a new trend too. I actually have noticed in Kroger that they've advertised not only that they're hiring, but they've got a new system where they will pay their employees every day after they perform their, you know, they show up and do their day of work. Um, our, I think our new our new workforce is going to be interested in getting paid more frequently, especially to get caught up on some bills and what have you. But that's also going to be helpful for you if you just schedule and pay a week at a time so that you can run tighter uh, financial projections. And that takes us into probably our least favorite and probably our most critical last you know best practice here. And that relates to your financials. Um, the numbers kind of aren't going to be on your side when you first get back, right? Um, between uh, disruptions simply to your typical revenue flow, um, you know, maybe having to get caught up on bills, 
and rebuilding a new kind of revenue mix um, and, and, and also really figuring out costs and how you can manage those costs. So one article I read, and I decided not to go this far, was like, really, you're going to need to refer to your financials every day. But you, you can't do it once a month. You cannot do it three months. You take your bills from two months ago to your accountant and say, can you show me how I'm doing? You're really going to have to be a lot more in tune to your business needs. And we really, we've been working with this um, sort of as a pilot, I would say, at Newtown, providing uh, these new cloud-based online accounting software programs really encourage you guys to look into these things. They're pretty minimal investments. And even if you aren't using them like to the top of their potential and in the way your account would like you to see, they can give you much more realistic up-to-the-date financial information than, um, you know, just a, a once a year report from your accountant or your, your annual tax return. Um, and, the, and the thing about these programs is they go ahead and they automatically populate your spending behavior into it. So once it's in there, you do need to go in there and correct the information, but it's not hours, anxious hours of inputting all the bills. And one of the things that we see folks do is really rely on their point of sale systems and reports, and they're really important tools. They especially, I think, help you identify your primary customer, but they do not help you understand if you're being profitable, and how you're gonna manage cash flow to pay your bills, right? We're running some programs right now, some webinars related to this, and we can also answer a lot of questions about some of these tools that are available. So really uh, encourage you to take the time right now to figure out what kind of tools you can use so you can regularly stay on top of your inventory and your financials. And so those were the, the key points that um, I pulled together at this point, Josh. That's great. I haven't seen any questions yet in the text, text in the chat box. If y'all have any um, questions or comments as we go, please go ahead and type those in so we can get to them at the end. Um, that was great, Bethany. I especially think, um, you know, all of you, uh, you run really unique businesses and um, you have really deep relationships with your customers. They're friends and neighbors. They're people that you know. Most of you have mission statements and uh, values and vision statements, but um, if you don't, it's a great time to do it. And if you do, it's a great time to redo it. Because uh, like Bethany said, the business side of this is going to be an incredible challenge. And figuring out a way to thread the needle with this new set of circumstances, you know, where can I find revenue and what expenses do I have to pay? It's like starting a completely new business plan um, to figure out how to break even and make profits given the set of cards we're holding right now. And so I think it's a great time to go ahead and redo that exercise. I popped a link into the chat box um, to, to uh, reevaluate why you're doing this. Because I think if we can tune back into why we're in business um, and why we're the only people that can do it, um, it can be great motivation for moving forward and also help us make those tough decisions we've got to make to, rem to, to find new profitability given the circumstances that we have. Now, um, the next segment was for me to talk a little bit about uh, PPP and EIDL. Just the latest updates. Uh, I think every day new EIDL advances are rolling in. Um, you're not getting any notifications from the SBA when those are approved. They just automatically appear as a deposit in whatever bank account you registered with the SBA when you applied for the advance. Um, the timing seems to be three weeks plus a couple days. Uh, pretty dependably. So um, if you have not heard anything about your EIDL award, that is normal, but I would mark your calendar about three weeks out and then start watching your um, bank account that you gave them. You'll see an automatic deposit pop up. And um, one other note about that is they're depositing $1,000 per employee and the employee's uh, number, there was no specification about how to fill that out. So they are just depositing whatever number you put in that box up to um, uh, 10 people. So up to $10,000 total. And we've heard from um, 
we've heard from people who registered their independent uh, contractors as employees, which, you know, they probably shouldn't have, but the SBA is just depositing that money anyway. So um, that's the first note there. No one we know of has gotten uh, any information about an actual loan from the program. Not, not, not a single person. Um, so we'll update you at some time in the future whenever um, loan officers actually begin contacting borrowers uh, about that process. So right now, the only thing that they seem to be processing are the advances. They are still processing them. So if you got an application in, I think you're still likely to get a deposit for $1,000 per employee. Um, but the loan process, we have no idea about. Now, for those of you who are also applying for the Paycheck Protection Program, um, now you only get forgiveness on the EIDL or the PPP. So if you're getting one of these advances or if you've already gotten one of these advances, they're going to reduce your PPP loan by the amount of the advance. And what we have learned in some cases is that um, the advance wipes out the PPP entirely, um, that there's not much left after you wipe, after you deduct the EIDL um, to make the PPP worth pursuing. Um, the good thing about the PPP is that that application process is reopened. We're not sure that the EIDL will at all, um, but right now the PPP process is reopened. So if you've not done a PPP application, you should go ahead and do one, and we're still running classes about how to fill out that application. So um, if you have additional questions or if you want to figure out how to fill out the application, go ahead and register for one of our PPP classes um, at um, the COVID-19 page on Newtown's website. Um, but Bethany, do you, do you want me to run through, we're running a little tight on time, do you want me to run through the ERC and PPP comparison? Or should Maybe we say, let's just let people know that that's out there and do it next week because I think it's good and we probably need a little time. But I do think people need to realize that that is an option to consider. All right, so I'm, I'm not going to do this whole presentation, but I'm just going to give you an overview. We really started out glossing over this program because it seemed like it was going to be way less valuable than the Paycheck Protection Program. But what we found is with the PPP, your, clock, your eight week clock for forgiveness on the loan starts ticking as soon as you take the money. And many of you are not reopening your businesses yet. So it puts you in this really difficult situation where if you want the forgiveness on the PPP, you gotta take all your employees off unemployment, bring them back onto your payroll where they're probably making less money, you got no work for them to do, and, um, and you got to do that for eight weeks and then lay them off again. So that's obviously not an ideal scenario. And then for some others of you, the PPP turns out to, um, you can't use it at all because your EIDL advance was as much or more than your PPP amount. So there is this alternative program called the Employee Retention Credit. And you can be a nonprofit or a for-profit business to use this program, but your revenues have to have dropped by 50 50% or you are partially or fully ordered to close. Those are the qualifications for this program. So a little bit different than the PPP. But if, if, um, if both those conditions apply, so you are a business and your revenues dropped or you are personally or partially ordered to close, you can get a $5,000 tax credit per employee. So it pays half the employee's wages up to that $5,000. And um, the way you benefit from this, tax credit is you basically just withhold um, payroll taxes you would have paid to the federal government. So up to half the employee's wages, when you go to file your um, payroll taxes, instead of filing and, pay and paying those payroll taxes, you get to move an amount equal to half your employee's wages from your payroll account over into your operating account. So um, for some of you, this is going to be a way better option than the PPP. Uh, the other great thing about this program is because it's done through this tax credit in your quarterly payroll filings, there is no application process. Um, so it's entirely within your control and it may be something that you should um, think about taking advantage of. And like Bethany said, we'll, um, we'll dive into some examples and additional information about the um, ERC next week. Um, 
And Josh, I do think it's important to note that the sole proprietors cannot use the ERC. Um, just, yeah. just the way our yeah. tax system works. Uh, you have to actually have, right? So uh, in, in, in this case, um, the PPP was written to allow sole proprietors uh, and owners who are compensating themselves with owner draws to participate, but um, the ERC is not set up that way because the way you apply for the credit is through your quarterly payroll tax filings. You have to be doing those quarterly payroll tax filings, so you actually it, it won't work for a sole proprietor. Um, that's a really important message. And there's some other stuff in there. We've got some examples um, of, of businesses on both sides, some who'd benefit more from PPP and some who'd benefit more from ERC. Um, so if, if you have additional questions, let us know and we can set up another class to go through these things specifically with you or, or talk with you one-on-one. -on -one. I wanna pitch it over to James though, because unemployment is probably a, um, def is definitely a, um, probably more universal concern right now. Good morning, thanks Josh. Yeah, the unemployment uh, continues to probably be one of the more complex uh, programs through this CARES Act. Um, we actually got new guidance on, on Sunday the 26th, so um, the Department of Labor keeps putting out updates every few days, and so we're working with the guidance from, from April 26th. Um, and it's complex one because we're, we're acting as employers trying to make sure we get benefits to our employees. And then we're also acting as, you know, independent contractors or self-employed people trying to get benefits for ourselves. So we're kind of working both sides of the coin. So it's a, it's a little bit complex, but any event, hopefully everybody's gotten the employer fire partial claim piece working pretty smoothly. You're used to sending that file, um, uploading it every once a week. The one thing I would make you aware of with regard to that program is that as you start to bring back your employees and you start to pay them or they start earning wages, you'll need to remember to update whatever they earned that week in that gross wages field in that spreadsheet. It's down there right past the $7,300 um, piece. So remember to do that because it'll offset some of their benefits, which is part of the, the issue we're getting into is that people are probably between the between the 365 that nets 306 for regular benefits and the 600 that, were, that nets the 504 for the pandemic piece, people are bringing home about $810 a week. And so, you know, until that runs out July 31st, we, we think there's just going to be this push pull between people wanting to stay on unemployment as opposed to coming back to work. But in any event, that's just something we'll all have to deal with on the, on the self-employed or, independent contractor piece, hopefully everybody's had a chance to go through and file their claim and have gotten through that 20 page um, application. If you haven't, we do an unemployment um, little specialization class and I'd encourage you to join that. Um, that presentation, I'm up to almost 30 slides in that, in that deck because it's just gotten really cumbersome to navigate all through those. So I would encourage you to join that. But hopefully everybody's gotten at least the initial claim filed. Um, a claims examiner is going to have to look at that twice, which is part of the part of the problem. They'll look at it the first time to deny you generally for your state benefits, and then and then Scott and I had a conversation yesterday. It's really not quite working like it's supposed to. Um, they're supposed to send those emails out and then get you to fill out the PUA side of it. The thing that I would let you remember though is they didn't really start doing this till April 22nd. So we're really only a week at best into it. So hopefully those kinks will get worked out and y'all will be able to go in and, and, and fill that out. And so um, once you fill it out, an examiner's gonna have to look at it again to determine the benefits. And once they do that, then, then they'll give you um, a claim number and set you up and you'll be able to actually, you'll have to go in each week and request a, a PUA benefit. Um, and so we'll probably get into more detail on that next week because I don't think we're, we're, we're in, we're ready to do that. But um, if you join the unemployment class, we, we talk about that because that's kind of the final step is, is making sure everybody starts to get their, um, their $600 because there's some complexities into that is, is based on earned income that you might make um, during a week. So um, any event, um, I'd encourage you to join the class to get a little more detail. So 
Um, I've got a few questions in here, so I guess we'll, we'll get those when we get back. So that's a quick update, Josh. Great, thanks, James. So looking back on the questions. Um, Simon, Sty asked about the making loan fund grants. I'm guessing he's talking about the 30 day, like Sullivan's 30 day fund. You can clarify. Um, yeah, I mean, several of those awards have already been made and um, I think the application process is still live. Uh, although he is trying to raise money to fund more loans. I believe he's given out all the money that he had already raised. Um, I saw Brian Nichols was on the call. He may have some other updates, but it looked to me like at least three quarters of the people who'd gotten awards previously were downtown businesses. So it looks like y'all have been very successful um, at applying for that program. Yes, they, they do have another round coming once the uh, community foundation you know, gets everything set up. They have another donor, so they'll there will be. I know at least one more round that has uh, thirty thousand in it, and I think that he's got some more coming too. So there could potentially be two more rounds, but there's definitely one more round going. And um, uh, I know that we already have a bunch of people in for that, but there might still be room uh, for some more because not everybody who applies qualifies. So. Still, once again, I can't reiterate it enough. If you haven't filled it out, don't think, well, I, I don't stand a chance. You have to fill it out to know if you have a chance. That's great. And then Scott asked, what if you're a sole proprietorship that is quarterly filings for your employees? I'm assuming that's about the um, employee retention credit. Um, I, uh, I don't know. I'm gonna have to do some research into that. I, I just was looking at the um, forms that you have to fill out and it seems like it may be possible for you to uh, file for the employee retention credit um, under that scenario. Uh, and then the next was about James on pandemic unemployment. Um, you know, they just started six days ago taking applications on the pandemic unemployment piece for the people who became eligible, like our sole proprietors, independent contractors, all that kind of stuff. So James, I, I haven't heard of anybody who's actually come out the other end of that with cash. Have you? No, not yet. Not yet. So I think that's pretty normal, Scott, unfortunately. Um, there, you know, I, I don't know. There's six days in and, and the clock's still ticking. And Tom asked, how, how do I file partial unemployment for employees returning to work with reduced hours and less pay? James, do you want to take that one? Yeah, in that, in that spreadsheet, I don't have it up. When you do the weekly upload, the one cell or two cells past the 7,300 question is a field called gross wages. And you just put whatever, if they earn 200 bucks that week, you just stick 200 in that, in that field when you upload it. Um, once a week, and then, and then it will go in and adjust their um, unemployment benefit based on those earnings. Great. It's maybe cell S or something. I can't. Yeah, we've had um, we've had lots of people ask that question. Like, um, even as you start bringing people back on, if you're bringing them back on at reduced hours or reduced pay. Uh, they probably are still eligible for that $600 portion of the pandemic unemployment, um, which can be a great way to ease them back into the workforce instead of snatching them out of what is, you know, for some people, the highest wages they've ever earned. So, um, yeah, if you can just continue to file the parcel unemployment claims and report the hours and wages you are paying, uh, the system should be automatically able to calculate their eligibility for the remaining programs. Um, and I just posted a link to the making 30 day fund. And like Brian said, if you haven't applied, go ahead and apply. Um, um, there's absolutely no reason not to. And Scott mentioned that Travis Jean, who was one of the recipients of the 30 day fund is donating 20% of sales to the 30 day fund, which is fantastic. So as we support each other, y'all think about that with, um, Travis Jean. So we run, we ran down to the end of the list. Does anybody have any other last questions? We're at 1101. <laughs> it's kind of uh, unbelievable to have gotten through that much stuff. Does anybody have any last questions or comments? Okay. Uh, Dr. Holiday mentioned that he'd like to learn more about the ERC. Um, 
I will, um, I'll, I'll, I'll reach out over email and we can schedule a time to talk a little bit more about the ERC or Bethany, maybe we need to put up a class ERC versus PPP. Yeah. Um, let's do it. It'd be, I think it'd just take 30 minutes, but it'd be worth doing. Yeah. So, so we'll Dr. Do Dr. Holiday and everybody, the, the, these links that we put a couple times powering Newtown, our COVID-19 page, just be on the lookout. We'll schedule a couple webinars this week on ERC versus PPP. So again, if you want to be sure you've got, got a handle on PPP, if you want to meet with James about the unemployment, Josh will do the ERC. I can help you with cash flow. Please just go there. Um, we've got, you know, like one going every other day and find a yeah. time. And like Josh said, I just want to underline, they're really intimate meetings. So it's just going to be you and a couple other people. So we can, um, you know, I know it's financial information, but you also get like two or three of the new town team to help you problem solve. I think they've been really, really helpful for the people who have joined us on those. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it, it's a, um, if we can do this and y'all know we're doing these classes all day, every day. And so um, it, it's really helpful to us too, if you can register for the classes and let us, let us try and help you a few at a time. Um, well, I think that's it. I am. Um, as always, this is one of the highlights of my week to be able to talk to y'all and see y'all and, and do whatever we can to help. I hope some of these resources have been useful to you. I'm incredibly grateful to my team for putting in all the time and doing the research and assembling this information to be able to get to you. Uh, I am so grateful for their help and I'm grateful for each of you continuing to show up working as hard as you can under incredibly stressful circumstances that none of us ever imagined we'd have to deal with. But many of you are, um, are figuring it out. And if you're not figuring it out yet, you're still showing up. And that is a big piece of it. So, um, you know, the, these crises, they shape, um, they, they turn us into uh, heroes in many cases. So as we've got to rise to these really trying circumstances, I um, have an incredible amount of respect for those of you who are working so hard to figure out new ways where your business can work. And it, it's, it's, it's as important to me as it is to you because when I look at your vision statements and your mission statements and think about why you got into this, um, every single one of you has got an incredibly personal reason for why you developed these businesses to serve our community and our friends and our neighbors. And, um, we just can't lose that purpose. Once we find that purpose and hold on to it, I'm sure we're gonna figure out a way to succeed. It was great to see y'all. If there's anything else we can do to help, I look forward to hearing from y'all by email or text or phone call. And um, we'll see you again next week, if not before on one of these calls. I hope y'all have a great week.